it's a, it's a heavy, heavy load about, because really you, we have all been raised by adolescent fathers who were raised by adolescent fathers for many, many generations. So the ancestral curse has been passed on. <laughs> all right, Rising Man family, I got another amazing man joining me here today. Philip Folsom coming in live from Venice, California, my man. How are you? Great. Uh, honored and pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. Great. We finally got you here on the show. You've got a wonderful perspective and, and quite the resume, I must say, of time and energy and experience. How long have you been in the realm of leadership and initiation and that type of work for? Boy, you know, we'll probably get into this, but I'm actually, I'm actually old enough. I, I was a part of the very first men's movement in the 80s. I was aware that there was, um, you know, the there was guys going out in the woods and we were doing Native American, North Native American um, rituals. It's kind of the same first introduction of Bly and Iron John. And, uh, you know, we also, you know, seeing King Warrior Magician Lover just start to come into that phase. But it uh, it never stuck. That's one of the things that we can talk about is why. It didn't work then, and it seems to be working now. And there's an integration uh, topic in there. Oh, cool. All right. So I'm definitely interested in getting into that. Before we jump into it, I ask everybody who comes on the show the same first question, and that is, for you, what does it mean to be a man? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, socially, biologically? Whatever you got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe that the act of uh, men is to do. Men are defined by what we do mm. and the level at which we take ownership of that central theme is the thing that eventually defines us. And you can't talk about what we do uh, without contrasting that with uh, what we inherently are. And women are valuable for what they are. Men are only valuable for what we do. It's an incredibly important dynamic that's just played out through every era and every culture around the world is that men are defined by what we do. And this is part of the good topic when you said, uh, what should we talk about with the younger guys? And I would, and I want to just tell you, hold the line because you are not valuable currently and you will be valuable soon. So hold the line. Um, right, young let's, women, let's go there. Yeah. Go ahead. Young women, incredibly powerful. A young woman can go down the street and write, write her own ticket. Basically, they can do almost whatever they want, right? The social um, currency of a young female is massive. They're valued by what they are. In the same way that children are valued for, for simply existing. Young men, you are valued by what you do. It's uh, how much can you make? Um, what, how much water do you draw? Uh, what is your position? That's power. And so, you know, there's, there's an ongoing process and through a young man's life where you start to understand how the world works. You start understanding yourself. You start being able to scale and weaponize and heal and you become powerful because what you can do. And, and uh, the inverse is also true for women is that there seems to be in society a downward scale of the value society places on women when they start aging. And so those two uh, lines on a graph seem to match uh, at some point in, you know, when males, when you get to be late thirties, forties, where you're ascendant because you have money making potential, you have positional potential, you have power. And so that's usually where people find their legitimate long-term partners is that there is now equity at that point. I so my, my coaching for all young men is, is if you're feeling inadequate right now, which you are hold the line, don't, 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 don't bail, you know, don't concede, don't give up, don't fall back into just the endless pursuit of external validation or pleasure because you are going to be powerful as long as you stay on the hero's journey. You will, you will complete your quest for vitality and power. Okay, cool. So let, let, let's dig this apart a little bit. All right. Cause I, I, a lot of the stuff you're saying is very intriguing to me. Now, first of all, 
based on your perspective, is this the way that it's always been? Or when did, when did the men start to only be valued for what they do? You think it's always been that way or is it just modern society? I, well, I wouldn't say just, I would say that, that that's an incredibly clean and valuable thing that you can own because it is a variable that uh, you get to dictate. You own that variable in your life as opposed to something just external, which, Hey, if you're, you're attractive or you're famous or you're whatever you are when you're, as you're showing up in the world, you know, that's, that's just what you got. And you can ride the, you can play those cards the best you can, but you're stuck with the hand you got. I see. So now, you're not saying, you're not saying that being valued for what you do is a negative thing. You're saying that's just, no, a, a I'm saying you want, uh, that's a, that's a reality. That's um, and, and, it's and it's something you can own. To own it. Right. I see. Yeah. Okay. Right. And it sucks being, um, you know, like you need experience to get a job. You need a job for experience. It's like, yeah, you're fucked. I get it. It sucks. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're, you're coming out of college in debt with no skills and no connections. And you know, you're looking at what your life should be comparing it to all the Instagram people mm -hmm. who are making money and publishing books and building auditoriums and, you know, doing very purpose driven, you know, exciting, important things. And you're not. And that, that's a, that's kind of a bitter pill. It's a tough thing to swallow. And, so it's a, it, this is a marathon. This is not a, uh, you know, a sprint. So pace yourself on, on that long trek up the mountain. Um, but following that analogy, uh, make sure you have the map going up the mountain. There is a map and it is a map that has been handed down by our ancestors for literally thousands of years. And Joseph Campbell says, you need not fear this journey alone for the heroes of all time have gone before us and the labyrinth is fully known. So really, really Campbell is saying that there is a roadmap and all you got to do is just crack open your mythology and you can see young men struggling with this thing. Right. Yeah. And, and I know where, I know where you're going. So I want to just pump the brakes for just a second. Cause you also mentioned something in the beginning that was really fascinating to me. You, you identified yourself as someone who was around for the first wave of the men's movement. And you say things mm -hmm. like iron, John, Bly, all that. Um, I'm interested in what you said about why it didn't stick. How, how come, how come mm -hmm. it didn't stick? It didn't stick because it wasn't connected to what men do. Hmm. Uh, the first men's movement and the challenge of some of the current men's movement is that it is escapist. Men are running from their responsibilities and their duties in the real world. And they're running off to escape into some sort of neo tribalism on one end, or some sort of um, commando, you know, comic con on the other end. And they're both escapist. Neither one of those is inherently valuable for society. And so they're, they're not fulfilling that primary function of men, which is what you do. You have a duty to perform. Men have a duty and you're defined by that duty and whatever that position in life is, is your duty. So once you become a dad, that's your responsibility is to be the best dad. You don't, you don't, you put away childish things to quote the Bible. You don't run off to um, Coachella when you have kids. You're, you're saying, not escaping you're a lot of a lot of what was brought forth in this first wave of the men's movement was more of a distraction from the natural responsibilities and, and functions of men in society. It, correct. It was it was an escape and it attracted the men who were looking to escape. I see. And you but, can see the same thing is true today. There's a lot of men who are unsuccessful and who are who are running from their their lack of success in their duties into um, an alternative um, burning man reality. They think that's what the world is. And so they are abandoning their responsibilities. And at some point um, when society not only doesn't value you because you've just abdicated your responsibilities, but it also now brings on a certain amount of shame and ridicule. You're not carrying your weight. You're not contributing to society. You have lost legitimacy and significance. I can't think of a worse thing for men is to be told that you are shameful and insignificant. So um, the moment that the, those of us who are participating in men's work were 
running off into the woods and drumming and hugging trees and whatnot. Uh, the moment that that was uh, a fancy word pilloried, which means made fun of publicly, um, it immediately imploded because nobody, no man wants to be seen like that. And so they're already getting beforehand, right? They thought they were escaping yeah. that and then they got yeah, exposed. So, and, so then you slink, slink back to your job. You didn't like in your relationship that was unfulfilling and your body that is not, uh, you know, which is shameful. And, and that was that. And so the, the curse was not broken. There is an answer. That's what men do. That's, that's the agenda of, of the male rise in power is at some point you grapple you identify and then grapple with the thing that your father didn't do. And that is the ancestral curse. So what were the failings of your father? And at some point, if you don't grapple with that, you're destined to become your father. And that's the big fear that men have inside at some point is that when we go into the fear, the cave we fear to enter, you know, that's where Darth Vader lives or Darth Vada, which is the dark father. So, you know, they, that's, that's really the big ancestral curse that um, we didn't break. But when the men's movement rose again in response to uh, a lot of different societal things, isolation is one of them, um, being pushed so hard by Me Too movements and uh, identity politics. There was a lot of things socially that um, drove men out to find their own identity because, you know, we're, we've been the whipping post for society for several decades, you know, uh, men. And so at some point you're seeing uh, the rise of the men's movement is uh, men who have been publicly shoved into a corner and now coming back and claiming, well, that I'm, I'm not appreciated. That's one of the core wounds of all men that I work with. Thousands of men and almost to a man, a, uh, they speak of a lack of appreciation. It's like, yeah, well, that's part of the ancestral curse is that we are men are no longer appreciated because we're the problem. And I and I'm not saying they're wrong. Men are the problem, but right. men are also the solution. And every time that you are going to um, point out the ills of men and there are many, you know, uh, adolescent men are destroying the world. You also have to acknowledge that men built the world. So at the same time that you're saying, you know, toxic masculinity, you should also then in the next breath say, thank you for running water and electricity and food in the fridge. Yeah. I think that's so, a really big key there is that it's, it, it often gets polarized, right? It's, it's, it's only this one way. It's, it's only all bad. And even like a word like patriarchy, I had a guest out here on the podcast uh, a, a couple of months ago, we were digging into the origins of the word patriarchy and the beginnings of patriarchy started off as something that I think a lot of people would get behind, right? It was, it was the function of a man being the one who, who represents and leads in his household, who is being an example of culture and values for mm -hmm. his wife and his children, who is creating a legacy to pass on to his, his kids. I think that's something everybody would sign up for. And that's what that's where a lot of this was actually sourced from. So one of the problems is that we often see the one thing that we want to see and we don't consider the other is what I'm hearing what you're saying. And uh, there is no pure patriarchy. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's different um, forms of leadership. And the, if, if there was only men running the world, the world wouldn't work. You know, like who do you think is raising the kids? Who, who's staffing the hospitals? Who's teaching the kids? Who's running a household? Like that's matriarchy. So they hold different spheres of leadership. We just look at, it's just really easy to look at, um, you know, the government um, industry leaders. You're, you're looking at the, at this, the very front veneer of the most outward source of power. And you would say, Oh, that's men. But there's also a lot of other power that is a, a full partnership. And if you ask uh, most of the men that you know, who runs the bank account in the family? Yeah. Um, women, women, women. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Almost uh, over 90% mm -hmm. of, of, um, of families, the woman runs the bank account. So ask who's really in charge. 
Where, where's the power? Definitely. And, women. Yeah, right there. Yeah, and and in anthropology, uh, the majority of indigenous cultures, you would call them matriarchal because women had the most obvious power, which is resource, resource related. Women ran the resource base. Um, they made decisions about um, <clears throat> how to delegate jobs and where the food goes. And here's marriages and everything intra-tribal, um, which is the decision making within the confines of the tribe is purely matriarchal, almost universally. And then that baton of leadership is handed to patriarchy when it has to do with extra tribal functions, such as hunting and war and defense and travel. And, and that's the, the pendulum or the wave that you can see in, you know, indigenous cultures. And, and it really is the one that's happening in our culture as well, except, um, the, the patriarchy has, is a little louder post agriculture because we're no longer, um, moving. We're no longer migrating. We're no longer gathering and hunting. We're stationary. And so there's a more of a, um, evidence towards the value of uh, defending your territory and defending your excess supplies. So let me, let me ask you something about that. Cause yeah. I, that's a really, that's a really interesting take on going all the way back to post agriculture. Cause if you, if you trace over the course of history on fast forward and all, and we start to domesticate further domesticate and further convenience our lives, would you say that agriculture and that whole wave was the beginning of the end of, men and masculinity and the way that we've. Yep. Uh, it was. Um, and, and um, uh, agriculture is no longer Mesopotamia. Agriculture has uh, been slid over to the Indus Valley. Right. Mm, right. And, and it's getting pushed back further. Mm. Every generation. It went out when I was in college, you know, it was agriculture. It was 12,000 years. And it was 15,000 years. And, and right. well, and, it, so it's getting older and older, but regardless, um, what agriculture did was was two important things. It it um, it gave us enough surplus of food that we didn't have to move, so we were stationary. Number two, that surplus of food uh, allowed us to form larger communities because if you were a hunter gatherer tribe, you know it's pretty bleak. You had to you had to move around as the plants were growing, you know, as, as things were blooming, as the herds were migrating. I think that's what we're built to do, but agriculture made us stationary and it made us large. And so the large part is really important because we, we no longer could maintain kinship systems in a large scale uh, community because kinship systems are the people that you know intimately and at a, at a, at a shared mythological territorial and belief centered uh, way. And so the moment and all the research says we can maintain less than a hundred humans in that kinship level. The moment you're in groups larger than a hundred, now we lose our kinship systems and they're replaced by what's called a pride based system or the, or individual centric system. So when you lose kinship, uh, that's the beginning of the end of, of not only traditional masculinity and your masculinity initiation rituals, all of all of these things, but it also uh, is the beginning of all of our struggles with um, resiliency and mental health. And uh, we see a war becomes much more lethal. There's always been war. Um, we're a warlike species, just like wolves are a warlike species. But um, the wars were in between small tribes and they were very ritualistic. And it was and there was a lot of partnership involved at the same time. But when you see cities warring against each other and states and, and countries, those become lethal. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the thoughts that I would say even just com competitiveness, right? Some of the, some of the old stories of what intertribal war looked like was sometimes it wasn't even, like you said, lethal. There were, there, there weren't even killings. It was more of a, a competition, right. like a, yep. like I, what you would equate like the Super Bowl to, right? Like men going to battle yeah. against each other and seeing who won for the rights to whatever they were warring over. And the tremendous amount of exchange of um, people, I mean, that's a really important one because that was part of the game was, you know, you were always be able to exchange, um, you know, young people for marriage. You can keep the bloodlines going mm -hmm. and you can trade. Now, so the trade has been going back for 
before our species. So, you know, Homo erectus is trading in Africa, you know, beads and shells from the ocean a thousand miles away or some, somehow finding their way inland. So, you know, we've, we've been an inherently intertribal species um, in, in that sense. And, and wolves are also, as soon as a, a pack gets big enough that you can't really fully express yourself within the, the pack, you started outgrown it and where well, there's no slot for you because it's time for you to lead or express yourself. Then the wolves kind of jettison out and they become interlopers and they look for another pack to either join or create uh, another pack with a, with a partner. And so that, that seems to be a you know, well-established in, you know, indigenous system that is well in place. The, the hard part, just to bring us back to men's work is when we lost our kinship systems, we lost initiation. Men are no, no longer ritually initiated from boyhood, you know, adolescent psychology into an adult psychology. And that's, that's the core of the ills of today in masculinity is that we're no longer in a position of the power of service. We've been stuck in an operating system or a currency of external validation. And there's 30, 40, 50, 60 year old men who are running around seeking external validation and seeking pleasure because they deserve it. Whereas an initiated man realizes that the currency that fulfills them is actually the kingdom. It's actually service. And um, the lack of that form of uh, viewing the world is, is really the source of what's, what's crippling us as a species. But let me ask you to do this. Will you define initiation from your perspective? An initiation is a rite of passage or it's a formal transition that moves you across a threshold into a new way of being, a new, a new way of seeing the world, a new set of beliefs or a new story that you see yourself living out. That's and, an initiation. And, and what role does community play in initiation? You cannot self-initiate because it involves the death of your old story. And your old story doesn't want to die because your old story is your reality. And, um, you know, when I say what I say to you, um, hey, you shouldn't be playing video games anymore. You're too old for that. You'd be like, oh, but I deserve it. And this is how I bond. And this is how I express myself in the world. And like, I know men who will, will go down swinging and die before they say video games are not my best choice or alcohol or porn or whatever they're doing that they know is not good for them at some point, but they'll defend that story because it's their identity. And you see it in politics. I can tell you some, like, we all know there's some absolute wankery shit on both sides of the political spectrum. And they know it. They know they're just absolutely being total wankers, but they can't admit it because they surrender their identity. And without that, what are you? And so they perpetuate the story to the point where um, it's not even true anymore. So um, what, of, what community does with initiation is it places good men at the exits. You don't get to run anymore. And the only time men experience this in our culture is in sports or the military or, you know, some other rare, maybe martial arts, right? The jujitsu schools have an initiation practice of, uh, hey, I haven't seen you in class this week. They'll call you. You know, other students will call you like, you haven't been to class. You OK? It's like, oh, yeah. Their That's it. That is what I'm hearing. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The like level and, of accountability there that's important. Mm -hmm. So that so that is also inherently tied to this initiatory journey. And one of the things you said to mm -hmm. me before we even started recording is that initiation is an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. So it's not a singular yep. event the way that you hold it. So can you can you say a little bit more about that and your perspective on the ongoing nature of it? You, you can explore initiation in any aspect of your life and a very valuable tool for all the folks listening. Uh, it, those, there's those four archetypes that most of us know in the men's work field or, it, but women also, right. There's that sovereign space, which is career warrior, which is your vitality, your physicality. You've got the magician, which 
it's money, right? And then you've got your lover house, which is relationships. You're at a different phase of each one of those houses. Like you might be doing great in your career, but your marriage is falling apart or you're fat or unhealthy, blood pressure is too high, whatever, you know. So you're initiated at an ongoing level, you know, up the mountain of, of being able to sacrifice what you want now for what you really want. And that's the difference between adolescents and adults. You, you've heard of the, you know, the marshmallow um, test for babies. They, uh, yeah. Put, if they give them two or give them, tell them we'll give it yeah. two later or you have one now. Yeah. Now, you know, kids that can defer gratification, right. They can go, I'm not eating it. Cause I know I get more later. That's a very mature child, mm-hmm. right? They've understood the correlation between short-term suffering now for long-term success in the future. I'm going to, I'm going to, I will just kind of make a blanket statement that that's what men do. Men defer pleasure, external gratification, short-term being liked a life of ease or any of those short-term pleasures. They're able to defer those for the long-term large scale, big game impact of service. Yeah. Which, which for me is where vision comes into place. And when I think about vision as part of a rites of passage journey or an initiatory experience, mm-hmm. that's when I can begin to imagine a future that is much further down the road. It's mm-hmm. not right in front of me. It's going to take years. There's going to be days upon days of repetitions and effort. They're ultimately going to build towards something. And I have to place my faith in what I can see in my mind's eye. It's not right in front of me. There's not the one marshmallow in front of me. It's two marshmallows that somebody told me is way out there. I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but yeah. I'm willing to go and fight for it. And so what, what, role, what role does vision play in your analysis? Um, well, it's at some point we're moving towards purpose, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's the vision or the expression of service would be living a purpose-driven life. What does that actually mean? And we know it's not eating donuts and what jerking off the porn, like that's not purpose driven. And yet ah, we keep dropping into this loop of this behavior. So purpose, like w- what is it? And a, a pretty simple way that, you know, we can extract, draw it out from mythology is um, the hero is always wounded, right? There's a, there's a wound that every hero has it trauma or disappointment or, dissatisfaction there, there's some wound that we all have and that's the thing that we're really passionate about right passion means to suffer uh the passion of the christ so the thing that has wounded us um it, the the healing of that process of that wound um that's the first step it, and, and a lot of times you know i want to yeah i want to be an astronaut and i want to you know whatever that 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 childish vision is, that's not really your vision. Your vision is sourced from the thing that broke your heart and the healing of that thing that broke your heart. And then where that purpose or that passion serves people is your purpose, right? So where your passion is and where that serves people is your purpose. And you you don't get to even land on that until you have walked it, which is why living life is so valuable. You, you don't do, go on a retreat and find your purpose. It doesn't work that way. And because you have to return home, right? With the new eyes, you have to, you have to be able to um, deal with your grief. You have to go into the woods. You have to go into the cave. It, there's, it's really messy and it's, it involves being here. That's where the healing takes place. Yeah, it makes me think of that line from Black Elk. Black Elk said that a vision, the power of a vision is not truly yours until you've brought it back and given it away and as a gift yeah. to your people. And that's yeah. where the action component comes into this. And in the the uh, tradition of rites of passage I'm familiar with, this stage would be called incorporation. 
which from Latin in corpus mm-hmm. to bring into your body. It's, it's just another word for embodiment. It means actually mm-hmm. living your gift on, on this planet, not just talking about it. And I think there's mm-hmm. in this society we live in where it's very easy to talk, right? It's very easy to talk or make a social media post and mm-hmm. not a lot of accountability because I can put on a face for 60 seconds of a reel and then I can go back to jerking off and doing all the other things you were talking about. I don't actually have to be living it. But when you said yep. that b- before th- that there's good men at the exits, right? There's nowhere else to hide that we're choosing that level of accountability and visibility for ourselves. The community is essential, right? The, we have, there is no, there is no incorporation or initiation journey without people to, to, to see it. To serve. And to serve. Absolutely. Yeah. To give back. To that, the, the people need to be served. And that's, that's really what the, that's the Holy grail of the quest is the Holy grail is the, the chalice that holds the elixir right? That that's the bringing of life that brings vitality back to the kingdom. It, um, and usually the, the quest is the King is sick. And so the hero has to go find the, the chalice and the grail and bring that, bring it back and heals the King and therefore heals the kingdom, which is that really important connection between, um, our father and then that ancestral father. It's all that, that whole, and what is our role? Well, our role is to heal our father, which, which means I have transcended. I have healed my father's wounds. I am no longer going to become my father. I have transcended that. And, and that's really the act of uh, finding the grail and bringing that back by vitality. And I think that's a particularly relevant topic for the men who I know are tuning in here on this podcast, because I, I've spoken with a lot of men and I've experienced it myself. There's, there's a lot that comes up when I imagine Ooh. Go, be going beyond my father, right? In, in mm-hmm. whatever way we're talking about, making more money than my father, having a more fulfilled life or doing some of the things that he never got around to doing in his lifetime. And then going deeper, healing some of the wounds that I witnessed mm-hmm. my father go through and then healing them for myself. It, it, it could bring up a lot of stuff for a man. So yeah. I wonder if you talk a little bit more about that and that experience. Um, it's one of the things that we do in, in K4 is that when you speak publicly in the forum, like if there's a hundred men on, um, you know, on a zoom call where we say, my name is, and I am the son of, and your father's full name. And then you make your statement every time. And when a lot of men come in to K4 and they're going through that three month rite of passage that we, that we do, and they hear it, it's like, and they almost can't do it. Say their father's name. It, and it's a, it's a heavy, heavy load about, because really you, we have all been raised by adolescent fathers who were raised by adolescent fathers for many, many generations. So the ancestral curse has been passed on for a thousand years. We have not broke that curse. The men's movement is really a waking up to the potential of breaking that curse. And, and, you know, for me, the, the magic bullet or tool is initiation because that's, but initiation is, is almost a placeholder for grow the fuck up, right? Like do what you're supposed to do. Um, you know, assume your duty uh, in our society. It, that's initiation. It's get off your fucking phone when you're driving. How about that? Put your shopping cart back. Yay, initiated man. Like, it's not this big epic thing that you have to go out and get smudged and do a vision quest to become an initiated man, put your shopping cart back. Right. That's a great first step. Yeah. And so talk, talk about those first steps. So what, what do those first steps really <laughs> represent to you? Cause that, cause that's, that's funny, right? I mean, it's almost yeah. comical, right? Like clean up after yourself. You know, I, I had a man yeah. that I really admire and I, I, I come from a similar, um, I was obviously wasn't around for the first wave of the men's movement, but a lot of the men who I look up to and who I learned from came from that same time. And there was this definition of honor that I received from one of these men. He said, honor mm-hmm. is doing the right thing, even when no one's looking. Right. And for me, that always came up, that, that came back to what, the example I always think of is when I walk out of the public restroom and, mm-hmm. I, and I walk and there, and somebody left a paper towel on the counter or on the ground. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, ah, fuck, it's a fucking public restroom. Like, I don't want to, I don't yeah. know what the hell is in that paper towel. But I know that if I walk past that, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to let it go. I'm going to say, you mm-hmm. know what, what I would want my son to go and make this bathroom a better place, even if it's not his. Right. 
100%. talk about talk about the simple stuff, man. Cause I'm sure you have a great point. Well, yeah, um, I do a lot of the leadership work down at USC, down at, at their business school. And one of the guys I work with, um, Adelaide Wortman, he runs the um, Bennis Scholars. It's their kind of highest echelon of young undergrad students who are great leaders and at a very prestigious university. And I was asking him once, like, well, how do you like, how do you find them? Is it a resume? You go through an interview process. <laughs> and he told me he tips a sign over outside his office window. And then he watches the students walk by and sees the ones that pick it up. <laughs> that's, his, that's his litmus test, huh? Hey, I, you know, he would probably be in a little bit of a smart ass when he said it, but I don't think he, I actually think he does this. Um, and I thought that what a perfect way of going like, that's a leader right. is, you know, a, a young person who's all worried about social things and stressed out by school and, just all the stuff that, you know, young people are stressed out about. Well, it'll stop and pick up a sign that's not their responsibility. That's a leader, you know? Yeah. So that, that is somebody who is, um, has been number one, raised well, which is another way of saying initiated they're, they're, They have character. And um, so all of those little things that are um, again, short-term impositions, that you can you can defer or sacrifice for some sort of a greater good. That's um, that's important, and it's it's getting harder and harder the more isolated we become as men, because people aren't watching you, and you don't have a lot of responsibility. Um, you know, people will will not engage with other people in the street. It's very rare, um, but there are a few you know magical events that happen. Um, for example, nobody will stop and help you if your car's broken down, unless you're out trying to push it. You'll notice you know, yeah. if you see a dude trying to push a car, yeah. you know, you get your ass out and you stand, you push the car, you help him. So well, that's, that's there are a few things that trigger men. Um, and afterwards, damn, you feel good. Everybody feels good. And it's a weird thing. You know, men who didn't know each other. We pushed a car, got it off the side of the road. You know, the, the, the great something. thing. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, you know, those are just, those are the little acts or the initiation acts. And obviously you scale this out to the people who are in government making big decisions, um, to not line their pockets, right. And make the right decision. Like that's, you know, if we can get initiated men and women into those positions, uh, that's, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a Holy grail. Yeah. Well, you know, going back to that first question I asked you, what does it mean to be a man? Uh, sometimes when I go on other people's podcasts, they know I ask that question. So they ask me and, and for mm -hmm. me, it's, it's actually very simple. Cause I, I, I could feel it internally when it happened to me, it was, I went from being this me referenced human on the planet where everything was about me. Everything was about my pleasure, my convenience, my wants and desires, and then turning 180 degrees outward and saying, what, what, what can I, how can I be of service to this world instead of how is this world going to serve me and take care of me and take care of my needs? And I really appreciate your perspective on how that's an ongoing journey. Cause it doesn't just, it's not like one day you snap your fingers, boom, you put a, a boy into a room and all of a sudden he becomes a man, right? It, don't, yeah. it doesn't work that way, at least, especially not now. And the process of, of shifting from the only thing I ever know is taking care of my own needs to taking care of other people and being of service to others. That's, that's a real journey. And then that's why men's movement, this men's work is so important because we can't just, you don't just check off the box and then carry on with your life. It's, it's an ongoing yeah. incorporation of it. Um, you dug into iron John, not, not too much, not okay. too much. No. Cause I, it's, I mean, I, 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 scour, I scanned it a bit and I, I, it, it, it mirrored a lot of the stuff that I've heard in other places. So I didn't really dig in mm. too deep. It, it's one of those central books in, in mythopoetics, which is the study of men's work, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Campbell, Bly, um, Moore, Gillette, those are, those are the, you know, those are the, the patron saints of maybe Carl Jung a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, in Iron John, uh, the prince who is, uh, uh, you know, a young man, mm -hmm. and he goes into, he, he suffers a wound, letting the wild man out, which we all do. That's the passion I was talking about. And he gets taken to the woods where he's given a sacred task, which is to keep everything that's unclean out of this sacred spring. And uh, this is a really 
really great analogy for the initiation process um, and the failures that we have or, or, and, and inherent steps of healing those failures. And so the first day, um, the prince's wound hurts so badly that he dips it in the cold water. He can't help himself. He's in too much pain. So that's strike one. So you can't get initiated if you are in pain. Like a monkey that's being electrocuted, you know, you're not a good monkey. You're angry. You bite. You jump. Like so, uh, just you have to heal trauma first before you're going into the initiation process. If you're if you're an alcoholic, if you have um, massive addiction issues, which are just trying to avoid the short term, avoid the pains of your trauma, you're not going to be initiated. You can't do it. So heal that first. That's where that's the lesson of day one. Day two. Okay, I healed the trauma. And the next thing I have to do is heal my identification with being a traumatized person. This is when we change the story of I am a wounded person. I am an addict. I am a, a vet with PTSD. I'm a, you know, a, a trauma survivor. That, that's a very limiting story that is going to define your reality forever. And you have to change that story. So day two, you have to start changing the story about what your identity is. We talked about that with the initiation phase. And day three, um, the prince has got that handled, handled his trauma and handled his story. So shit's not falling in, in, you know, into the sacred spring. And he's feeling really good about himself. Proud, if you will, even. And, and good job. And he's looking at his face in the mirror going, you know what, kid? You made it. He did better than your dad and looks a little closer and his hair falls into the sacred spring. Strike three. Um, and so that last day is a really important one. When we start congratulating ourselves on all the work we've done, what a valuable thing we've done. We've healed our trauma. Uh, I'm in shape. I'm making money. I've broken the ancestral curse. And, and then you have to realize that it's never about you. It was always about, are you able to take that wisdom and medicine back to the people? And that's a really important switch. And it involves the death of self. You're no longer important. And that is a, um, the, the last phase of the hero's journey is that the character, right? Whether it be Neo or, or Harry Potter or Frodo, like you name it, they all ha have to be willing to die. Hoka hey. Today's a good day to die. And, and the moment you're willing to die is when you're reborn. And that, so those three days of the sacred spring in Iron John is a very good roadmap for all the young men that are looking at the initiation process. And the rest of the book is actually a step-by-step -step guide on how to solve those three days. You know, there's the abyss, it's grief, it's the walled garden, big metaphor there. So, Highly recommend all y'all, um, you know, young men or older guys, you know, who are looking at initiation and healing iron John and, uh, it's a deep dive. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely going to have to dig back into that one. Um, so let me, let me, let me circle back to something you said earlier. Uh, one of the first things you said, especially when we started addressing the younger men in our society was hold the line. So yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you to dig in a little bit more about what does that, what does that mean? What, what does hold the line mean to you? Walk through those three days. Start going through those three days at the sacred spring. And those three days may take you three years. They may take you three decades to go through those. But if you're bleeding out all over all the important people and projects in your life, you're never going to be able to live a life of purpose and meaning and significance. So like hold the line on the work. You have to keep doing the work and it's okay. If it's work on yourself, you need to do work on yourself. You don't have to immediately try to jump to um, starting a podcast or yeah, I'm going to run a retreat. I'm going to start my own men's movement. You don't have to do that to be significant and to be important. In fact, it's not going to work for you unless you have healed yourself first. It's a really important thing. Uh, the term is spiritual bypass of I want to jump right over that messy, awful, scary stuff and get right into service because service feels good. Service is dopamine. 
Like it's immediate gratification of, you know, I'm a life coach. I'm a spiritual coach or I'm a breathwork coach. It's like, no, you need to go and you need to actually do the work first um, and learn how to integrate that work so that uh, the evidence is irrefutable. And I would challenge all of the young men to look at your life, stand in front of the mirror naked with your bank account in your hand and look at your life because your life is evidence of your efficacy. Your practices, your skill set, your worldview, your applied philosophy, uh, your story. It's a test of your story. Um, when you have to look at your career, your vitality, your bank account and your relationship. I mean, is it on point? All of those four houses or do you have a three legged horse? Which means, you know, I've got three legs that are OK, but there's one that's crippled. And, and that one that's crippled, you have to handle. You got to address that one first. Otherwise, you don't get to ever go on the big quest. So um, for the young man, walk through those, walk through those days. Um, heal yourself from the, the traumas that you have um, undoubtedly taken on. Because life is hard, particularly now. And, and um, if you're coping, if you're avoiding, if you're procrastinating, if you're experiencing any host of uh, dysregulation issues, hey, handle those, handle those first, and then go to the next phase, right? Which is um, start uh, your discipline practice, uh, stop fighting everything and start. And, and we use the analogy of, when, when we're in the road of trials, we, we finally locked up with our big demons and we're fighting them. We're fighting dragons because that's what knights do. Young heroes fight dragons and they save maidens and they claim gold. Um, at some point, we transition from the story of I need to fight everything and define myself into um, I'm going to ride dragons instead of fighting dragons. And this is, this is when we integrate our stories. And we have now realized that the things that broke our heart are actually our superpower. The thing that, that you're insecure about right now and you sorting through that journey of healing that thing. He, and really it's an, it's a, it's a relationship with that thing. It's never going away. The things that broke your heart and you want to hide and it kind of crippled you, that's your superpower. And so ride that thing. I like that. I've never heard that yeah. one before. Is Invite it to the dragons, table. Ride the dragons. Invite yeah. that thing to the table. It will be with you forever. It will be your conscience and your superpower. And even um, uh, two things. Um, Victor Frankl said that the line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man and who would willingly kill half their own heart. Next statement. And um, this would be by Carl Jung. Um, a tree whose branches would go to heaven. Its roots must reach to hell. So you're not trying to just wall off or kill your weakness or your wound. You're trying to utilize that thing as a source of your identity where passion serves people, right? Where your wound serves people. That's your purpose. So, um, you know, that's a messy, messy uh, and unsexy time. And no young man wants to go do, go wallow in, it's called ashes, that phase of ashes. And yeah. even like the, the Haida, you're, you're rocking a little Haida hat. Um, you know, there's a time where you laid in ashes in the, in the, in the longhouse. There was a, you know, a period of a couple potentially months for these young men who are just suffering in the grief of growing up and they don't get to do the young boy things anymore. And they let these dudes just lay in the ashes. And uh, that's, and that is almost a universal, the ashes phase is not sexy. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the thing that a lot of young men never got to hear, whether it was because they were raised by adolescent fathers or because you, I mean, you name it, right. You name it. There weren't enough uncles around or whatever it was that there's going to be a time and stage of life that is just uncomfortable. And, it, and, and that's, that's the way it's going to be. And it's not just all of a sudden going to get easy someday. 
And yeah. one of the worst narratives in the world is that we should look for greater ease and comfort in our lives. It's 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 been woven into the narrative everywhere, right? Like, go sit on mm. your couch, enjoy a drink, yeah. cozy up with some and, Netflix. And, and you're okay the way you are. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. You are not okay. You are you are inadequate for the life you want to live. Like when you talk about vision, yeah, uh, that vision that you want to live, your current behavior is inadequate. Right. And you get to change it. What an incredibly powerful, powerful, remarkable new story to realize oh, I can I can upgrade my entire operating system. But it's going to be hard because I'm the old one's going to have to die and I'm going to need some help. And again, Iron John, they call them bucket men to bucket out the wild man, your authenticity. Uh, you can't do that job alone. You cannot init- self initiate. You need to have three good men to help you through that um, threshold. Right. And I think that's the piece that's most important is that the, the young men out there who think that they have to do it all on their own, or they don't even know where to begin. I don't even know where yep. to start. I don't even know. Okay, fine. That's what I'm supposed to do is lie in the ashes and embrace the suck. But, but how do I do that? That's why the men's movement just can't, even, even if that first wave didn't stick, it has to come back yeah. again because the only way it's going to move forward is if there are these, these networks of support. And, oh yeah. It, and listen, um, there's a, there's a brand for you, mm-hmm. all the men watching, there's a brand for you. Mm-hmm. And Hey, we all have a, a nature about us. And we also have a nurture about us that, you know, you, you may be a super woke dude, you know, that that's where you have been indoctrinated and, and it makes sense for you. And you're inspired by that path. There's a men's group for you. And, and you should dig into that men's group deep, like get in because, you know, the, the time of the lone wolf is over. You, you, you are never going to hunt the big game of a fulfilling life by yourself. You like you to be a young man, trying to live a life alone and trying to shop meal prep, run a career, get in shape, like good luck. You you can't do it. Like you need a partner or partners to fulfill that, that journey. And, and again, if you're, and if you're, you know, a conservative faith-based young man, there's a men's group for you. You know, there, there's a men's group somewhere that matches your, your vision for the future, your values of behavior, the mission that you're on and uh, get with them and explore a couple. Um, And if there, and there's a remote men's work, I mean, there's no excuse not to be part of a men's group. Definitely Um, not. Nowadays, no excuses, no more excuses. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Philip, man, I I really enjoyed getting to dig into your brain and, and hear your perspective on things. Thanks for taking us back in time a bit to, look at the, where this all started for a lot of us who don't even know, you know, who don't know things like Iron John and going back to Bly and more and all those guys. Um, I want to ask you a few rapid fire questions and then tell us a little bit more about what you guys are up to over there. First one is what's one thing that you wish you knew back when you were 18? Oh gosh. Um, um, Meditate and get sober. There you go. And what do you think is the most important value to have as a man? Uh, grow. Growth. Uh, last, last one. What is one thing the world needs more or less of for men right now? Oh boy. Uh, they need more purpose and less pleasure. Nice. I like it. All right, man. Uh, tell us where to go to find out about K4, everything that you're doing. Where's the, yeah. the socials? Where do you want people to go to find follow? Mm. You? Well, um, let's see our men's group that I formed with my brother, Joshua Winner, who it was just on, on your podcast too. Yeah, uh, I mean. So K4, and this stands for King of the Four Houses. Those, those four masculine archetypes. And the website is k4men.com. Great men's group, uh, very traditional in terms of mythopoetics. Iron John, Bly, Campbell, all of that work. Okay. And then the other one is... Uh, that's my company. It's called Wolf Tribe and I do leadership and culture development work. So if anybody is uh, needing to upgrade the operating system of their team or organization, that's what I do. And the website is mywolftribe.com. 
Amazing, Philip. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time to drop in with us here today, man. Really appreciate your wisdom. And um, yeah, I love the work that you guys are doing out there. So I'll keep tracking you and follow up with you sooner on down the road. My man. Good to hang out, bro. Likewise, likewise. Likewise.